Our gospel reading this morning comes to us from Luke's gospel, the 18th chapter. Indeed, it is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Friends, listen now for the word of the Lord. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I think there is no denying, despite the warmer weather these last two days, autumn is here, is it not? The cooler weather this past week, all the pumpkins in the front yard at the church, and again, thank you to those who helped receive and unload the pumpkin truck on Monday evening. Thank you, those of you who have helped out with the pumpkin patch and shopped there this week or told friends about it. Thank you. But it is one of those unmistakable signs of fall, of autumn here, that I've grown accustomed to. I don't know about you. Um, you know, moving eight, well, seven, eight years ago now from Florida where we didn't really have seasons, maybe we had two weeks of cooler weather where you might have to think about whether to wear pants or shorts for a few weeks. It is wonderful to have seasons. I, I really do love them, and I love autumn. I love the colors of the season, the browns and the reds and the golds and the autumn leaves. And I love the fact that the world truly looks different in every season. It does. Just to look outside, creation tells us of a God that loves variety that loves the different colors, the different times. Some time ago, we said that a parable is a bit like a poem, or if you will, like a gem. That if we hold the gem up to the light, we'll see it a certain way. But if we turn the gem just ever so slightly, we might see something very different in that light, in that gem. Parable is much like this because as we read the parables and we see something new each time, God's teaching us something new and different. Just like the seasons that tell us something different, I believe, of our God. And so we come to the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Most likely a parable we are rather familiar with. We probably know this parable fairly well. We probably know what this parable is teaching us, is telling us about pride and humility and earnest faith versus arrogance. And all that is right and true and absolutely. The tax collector disdained as taking off the top stealing from the people, and then what's worse, giving the bulk of the money that, that he collected, right, to those Romans occupying our land. And the Pharisee, the Pharisee, an insider in the religious culture who kept the law all of his life, most likely, at least as well as humanly possible, they go to the temple to pray. And of course, the conventional reading, right, is that this tax collector, as Jesus says, goes home justified. Why? Because of the earnestness of his prayer, because of his humility, because he recognizes that he can't earn righteousness. He can't be righteous in and of 
his own ability. Whereas the Pharisee seems to think that he can and does. And it is a message about humility. Jesus spoke against pride over and over again. And he talked about those who could, thought they could save themselves, right, by living the law. Or really thought that God owed them something for living the law as well as possible. But again, tax collector is the one who goes home justified. And the Pharisee, by contrast, ends up where? Well, we're not really sure. I mean, the Pharisee is condemned, and he's going to be humbled, Jesus says. What does that look like? What does that mean? Does that mean the Pharisee's then out? Doesn't get into heaven? Is excluded? Maybe. It reminds me, though, the scenario, a little bit of the parable of the prodigal son, another parable, but a similar dynamic. We have a younger son who goes off and lives frivolously, wastes has half of the inheritance, comes back, begs mercy. I'm not even sure he means it, but he does, and the father welcomes him back. We've got the older brother who likewise, like our Pharisee, thinks he's done it all right. He's been good. And who judges the younger brother contemptuously. The father isn't so condemning of the older brother as Jesus seems to be of the Pharisee. Are you with me? I'm worried about the Pharisee here. Do you see that? I'm worried about the older brothers out there. Because if we look around the pews, many of us who are here, maybe we can relate a little bit more to the older brother if we're honest about it. Yeah. We're the ones often being responsible. We're the ones who often try to do what's right or what's best. We're the ones praying to God and grateful for the things that we have in our lives and maybe for gratitude for the mistakes we haven't made at times in our lives. Yeah, we don't judge that older brother quite so harshly as we might the Pharisee. I want to ask you this. If this is a parable, the Pharisee and the tax collector, about judging, where does our judgment of the Pharisee begin and end? (laughs) Is it fair for us to be harsh about the Pharisee who judges others? Do you see what I'm saying? Where does our judgment of the Pharisee end and our discernment of spiritual health begin. It's a question I honestly ask myself as a pastor from time to time. Do I think myself better by seeing the spiritual flaws and blemishes of others? Am I the Pharisee who gets left out of the kingdom because of my efforts to be faithful? Even if that means, or just because that means, I might see myself as further along, you know? for all this spiritual wisdom that I have. Where does the cycle of judgment end, anyway? Will it lead us all the way to a cross? It strikes me that the Pharisee and the tax collector in our parable went to the temple seeking God. Did they find the Lord? Well, the gospel says the tax collector certainly did because he was earnest and humble. The Pharisee was also very earnest, mind you, but not so humble. That's the problem, isn't it? That's according to the way that most of the time we read the parable. And it is a valid reading of the parable. It is the, 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 the way that we've read it, most of us, all of our lives. And I was so glad for the children's sermon and, and Susan's explanation of it because that's, that is the way that we understand the parable. But I want to turn the light just a little bit, not to say this is a better reading, but a slightly different one, to see if you'll follow me here. Jewish scholar Amy Jill Levine adds a possible 
reading alongside our conventional one. She argues actually for a translation of the parable that says the tax collector leaves not instead of the Pharisee, but on account of the Pharisee. Yeah, can you believe it? The passage could possibly be translated that the tax collector leaves on account of the Pharisee. Isn't that crazy? I mean, it's such a different way to read it. How could we read it any differently? And she argues for that translation suggesting, follow this, that we as Christians believe we are justified on account of the righteousness of another, Jesus Christ. So in this instance, she's saying your parable could be read to understand that the tax collector's justified because of the righteousness of the Pharisee, just like we are justified because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's an interesting reading, isn't it? Not the first one I'd necessarily go to, but it is a little different, and it's disturbing, and so we kind of can't dismiss it for that reason. Parables are supposed to disturb a little bit. It's okay if we don't know which reading to take. Because ultimately, reading the parables, friends, isn't about reading them right, but it's about reading them well. Reading them well, wrestling with them, struggling with what disturbs us in them, finding where God is in that so that we can grow in our faith. Our salvation, friends, doesn't hinge on our understanding the parables properly, but our work, our ability to seek and work for the kingdom of God does. Our salvation rests in Jesus Christ, all right? But how we understand what he taught us will affect whether we're able to work for the kingdom, for Christ's kingdom here on earth, well or not. You see, we have to grow, not once in, in earning our salvation through Christ, not once in learning the lesson or the moral of the story, as we've been saying all along, the parables are so much more than a moral in the story, but we have to grow and grow and grow by wrestling with these different ways of encountering different eyes that see the Scriptures differently, of seeing the light through that gem just slightly differently when we turn it. That's why the Word of God is so powerful, because no matter who you are or where you are, when you live in history, it is truth. And it will speak to your heart and soul. But back to our Pharisee. You know, it does occur to me that I don't know that I would, you know, if you're picking one person you can have dinner with in history, that this guy would be the one I'd choose, despite the fact that he's not real, he's in a parable. But I do think the world is truly a better place for the older brothers the Pharisees, those who try to be responsible, those who try to be faithful to what God calls of us, even if they are a little full of themselves from time to time. Hopefully, they learn not to be. Maybe they get a little frustrated they've tried so hard to please God to make life better for those around them. They've done their part, and others don't always but honestly, I can relate, can't you? Hmm. You know, it is said in Scripture that prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Now, maybe in saying the tax collector leaves justified doesn't necessarily mean the Pharisee wasn't already. And that's the point that Amy Jo Levine is making, I think. Is it possible in our parable there's actually a happy ending? Can we expect that from the Bible? I think so. 
That maybe somehow the Pharisee and the tax collector, even though, yeah, the tax collector needs to learn to change his ways, the Pharisee needs to learn a little humility, but ultimately they both can belong in Christ's kingdom? Is that a possibility? Here's a little happily ever after for you. I have an ending the parable doesn't give us, and, and, and this is not biblical. It's the book of Mike, so take it for what it's worth. But I can't help myself. Imagine where this parable could go, right? You see, I like to think that the, the tax collector, he leaves the temple justified because he was so earnest in seeking mercy. And, and, and I like to think that he was also justified by the, the faithful uh, people of God who continued to speak what was good and right, and, and it helped reach him. And he heard it, and that was why he went to the temple praying for forgiveness. I also like to think that, that, that his prayer softened his heart, that, that his prayer and the Pharisee's prayer softened the Pharisee's heart, and that the Pharisee recognized the, the, the judgment that he was feeling for the tax collector and that it wasn't fair. I, I like to imagine the two of them almost smiling at each other when they leave the temple. I mean, can't you just see it? One kind of sheepish, the other maybe a little haughty, but still they're trying. I like to think the tax collector went home and actually made amends with anybody he'd ever cheated before, repaying them as the law required. And I like to think that the Pharisee began to not look down on the others around him so frequently or so cruelly. That the kingdom took root in their hearts and their minds in a powerful way that they were changed. What do you think? Is that possible? Can we hold on to hope for that kind of an ending? But there's more. There's more. I, 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 it, it, it doesn't quite end there in, in, in my imaginative ending of this parable. See, I imagine they're both invited to a party, uh, maybe a week or two later. You, you see a father's throwing a party for a son that came back unexpectedly from a foreign country. And everyone was invited. And I see this Pharisee there. And I see this tax collector there. And they bump into each other. Yeah. And they share a toast. And, and they start to laugh a little bit, and they tell some stories. And, and by the end of the evening, they embrace each other as children of God. That's the kingdom right there. That's Christ's kingdom. Right there, in changed hearts and changed behavior. Yeah. But maybe that's a parable we have to write for ourselves another day. And one that we have to learn to write with our lives. Amen. Now, friends, all of that was something of a preamble to the real sermon today, which is actually shorter than what I just did, so don't worry. But you see, we are entering stewardship season. Oh no, here it goes. We're entering stewardship season here at First Presbyterian Church. This week is the first week of our stewardship season, and I'm really excited about it this year because it's gonna be something different than we've ever done before, and maybe that you've ever done before in any church for stewardship. Our theme this week is we grow, and we've been talking about that. How do we grow? How do we see scripture in new ways to challenge us and to change hearts, minds, and behaviors? How do we grow as Christians? Growth is taking scripture, the gem of truth, and holding it into the light, staying with it, 
wrestling with it like Jacob did with the angel, learning and implementing what the Bible, what our faith is teaching us. That is growth. Psalm 84, as we read before, happy are those who live in God's house. They go from strength to strength. Dwelling in God's house is about abiding, abiding in God's light and truth. That's what the psalm's talking about there. And when I look around us, I don't think that it's ever been more important to do the work of growing in our faith. This week in your bulletin, you probably noticed a little insert. Looks different than any other stewardship insert probably we've ever given you. I think it does. This is our We Grow Pledge. Each week during stewardship, we have a different theme because we're talking about whole life giving. How everything that is ours, everything that we are, is God's. How are we going to use what we've been given? How are we going to live our lives so that God is glorified and the people can be blessed? We're going to have four weeks of dedications or commitments that we'll make. And you'll get a different pledge sheet each week. This week is we grow. Next week it'll be we serve. Then we connect and we give. And I believe this is a path to an abundant life in Christ. Please don't think of stewardship as being about what the church wants from you. This is about what your church wants for you. We want to grow. We want to serve. We want to connect. And we want that for you. And yes, we want to give generously in our lives. That's a blessing for all of us. And so these pledge forms are for you. For you to take, we're asking you to take them, pray about them, fill them out, bring them back. There are more in the narthex if you need more, if you just got one, bull, you know, one bulletin for your family or whatever. We've got more, but we, we want you to take these, pray about them, fill them out. You can bring them back on Dedication Sunday with your other pledge sheets that you'll collect the next several weeks. Dedication Sunday is November 13th, so you'll bring that back together. But what's really cool is on top of this, there are resources on our website there's a We Grow page at fpcconway.org. There's a We Grow page where you can see a, a listing of our Sunday school or Bible study opportunities. You can see uh, our small group listings. You can, uh, you can um, see podcasts that we as a church recommend that you listen to. You can listen to these while you're driving or while you're folding laundry, or whatever you do during the day, it's great activity and a great way to grow your faith while you're doing the chores of, of daily living. But those are great resources for you. You can pray and fill this out. You can look at the webpage info to see uh, resources to follow up on what your pledges are. And here's the thing, we're not gonna chase you down and say, well, you signed up, you want Sunday school, so come to my class. We're asking you to pray about it, pledge it before God, and then follow up. So we're giving you the contact information of those you need to reach out to, to get involved. Fair enough? It's all there for you. You know, it is up to all of us to be the church. To offer the prayers of the faithful and the righteous as often as we can. For the benefit of all God's people, it's also up to us to be earnest in our humility, recognizing the ways that we do sometimes fall short of God's glory. It's up to us to work towards Christ's kingdom and the persistent work of spiritual growth together. Amen.